I am now going to turn over the time um, to Ms. Kay Neff. Kay Neff, if you don't know her, is a wonderful uh, addition to our community. It's been so wonderful for Cooperative Extension. It's, she's taking us in as a, um, <clears throat> as a guest to their campus. And so Hopi Cooperative Extension Office has an office at her school. And we also have gardens and hoop houses, all these great outdoor classrooms that she's letting us um, utilize to help teach you more. She is a teacher. She teaches this course that she's offering um, today with Kansas Master Gardener Program. Um, the Master Gardener Program is offered through Cooperative Extension. And she's a teacher in that. She teaches the herb section. And when we learned that, like a year ago, we've been working to get this class together for you. So I'm so grateful to have um, other community members who know so much and are willing to share. That's what we're all about. And so I'm happy to turn the time over to Ms. K. Neff, and she will take it from here and let us know a little bit more about who she is. All right, Ms. K. Neff, go ahead. Oh, I'm so glad to see all of you here. Uh, I'm K. Neff, and I do work on Hopi I'm here about uh, 75 to 80 percent of the time. Uh, the other time I have a small farm in Kansas. We are actually on the same latitude as Hopi, so we, we share a lot of the uh, the weather with you, not quite so much the dry, but uh, uh, it, it kind of crosses over very well. So we'll talk about herbs today and we also grow vegetables. So herbs and vegetables are just a nice, uh, nice cross. Okay, so we're gonna talk about growing herbs. Uh, the greatest thing about herbs is that they thrive on poor soil and neglect, which makes them great for uh, Kansas and Hopi. Um, they can be grown just about anywhere with the uh, a few things. You want to choose a good location for your herb garden. You want it convenient to your house so that you can just run out there when you're doing uh, your nequivi or your uh, iced tea or anything. Just go out and, and grab it. Sunny, not a problem out here usually. Uh, you need at least six to eight hours of sun to qualify as full sun. When we're, when we're talking about full sun, six to eight hours is, is minimum full sun. Uh, if you're worried about getting too much sun, which sometimes can be a problem, you can plant it on the, your east side so that you get all that good morning sun right up until about mid-afternoon and then the sun will come over there. Uh, you need easy access to water or you're going to be uh, taking your pitchers out all the time and, and filling those, uh, those pots. A windbreak is a good idea. I think on that previous picture you may have noticed the straw bales around something to kind of break that wind from those early uh, plants that we get out there in about uh, mid-April. And your soil, uh, well-drained soil is good. So the, the sand is, is great. Uh, if it's something that needs a little bit more water, you're gonna wanna adjust that. And that's kind of an, event, uh, an example of planting on the east side so that you've got you know, that, uh, that sun break for the afternoon, that'll help all your, your uh, things that are a little bit, you know, you want good tomatoes, you want lots of good sun for your tomatoes, but you don't want it to blister. So you need some uh, protection in the afternoon. When we plant garden, we try to incorporate the herbs in with our flowers and vegetables because they're good pollinators. Uh, you can get a lot of good uh, pollination activity for your fruits and your vegetables and you wanna plant beneficial varieties together. I, if you were able to print out your handouts, there's a kind of a grid that shows you what herbs will do what things for your garden and what companion plants will be good for your vegetables. I like to divide my garden into kind of sections so that you don't have to tromp all the way through. So if you don't have good clear paths, you can use a quadrant section to where you can you know, plant things. When, when you do that first reach, that's as far as you can reach. So you may not wanna plant farther than you could just reach out uh, to either harvest your vegetables or your herbs. You wanna plant like watering needs together. There's, there are herbs and vegetables both. Some take a lot of water and some take a very minimal amount of water. So you wanna kind of grid off your section so that you're always getting a good, a good watering. Uh, Path. So you don't want to plant your basil right next to your rosemary because your basil takes a lot more water than your rosemary does. So you want to be sure that you've got your, your, your watering needs kind of divided. And maybe containers are better for you. If you've got just super sandy soil that there, it just doesn't hold anything, you may want to invest in some large containers. 
uh, that you can plant one or two varieties in. If you're getting a new plot together, uh, weed, 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 you wanna get as much uh, weeds out of your garden as you can. Uh, introduce your mulch and organic matter. Uh, if you don't have a compost uh, bin started, uh, you wanna do that just pretty close to right away and they can be as elaborate as you want or just uh, we knock several uh, pallets together and use that for ours and then we just tear it open, uh, move on to the next uh, place. You can make a square, uh, I think here in the garden at the school, we've got straw bales encasing our uh, compost. So we just throw the compost in there and then when it's composted, it'll all just be great soil. Uh, you wanna turn your soil and water a day or two before planting, that gives a chance for all the little seedlings and the weedlings to come up and then you can just rake those off before you plant. Okay, we talked a little about, about watering needs. Uh, maybe you wanna do some raised beds so that they're easier to get to or you're, you can introduce some other things into your soil beso besides sand. At home uh, in Kansas, we are very heavy clay and we're kind of jealous of the nice sandy soil out here. So people in, in our part of the world will think, oh, I could just add sand to it. Well, sand and clay make what? So make a very nice little house out of bricks, but it's not going to help amend our soil. So we wanna keep amending it with uh, good compost, with uh, manure, with uh, composted leaves, that kind of thing is what you wanna to, want to get into it. Um, and that'll keep your, your plants healthier too. Okay, here's an example of some of what I'm talking about, about dry, dry loving herbs and, and wet loving herbs. Uh, lavender, rosemary, sage and thyme, all of those are kind of dry loving and you can kind of get used to that. If you're planting a plant and it looks kind of gray like lavender and rosemary, then you know that's a, a, an herb or a plant that's going to take a lot more dry. Uh, mint, basil, chervil, cilantro, those are all uh, herbs that need a little bit more water. So maybe you wanna put those in a separate area. Maybe there's a place off your, your house or your shed or something that gets some uh, water collection and drips. Um, I plant mint just around our, our water hydrants at home so that they get that extra drip and get that good stuff. Okay, then you also have to think, is this herb a perennial? Is it an annual? Is it a biennial? Uh, most of you probably already know this, but we're gonna go through it anyway. A perennial takes two years to go, or more than two years. Perennial will just come back and it, it keeps going ever after. An annual has one year of growth from the time the seed sprouts to the time the plant dies is one growing season. So it's like tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, those things have to be replanted every day. Biennials, they're like beets, uh, chard, turnips. They're something that takes two years to go from the first planting of the seed to the next planting. If you just leave them grow, like if you pull them, of course, your beets aren't gonna come back. But if you let them go through that full uh, plant stage, you're gonna have a, a two year period. And the, the perennial uh, herbs that we talk about, chives, mint, sage, those are gonna come back pretty much every year. Uh, annuals, basil, cilantro, nasturtiums. Uh, at home, basil is one of our favorites and people always say, can I bring it in? Not really, because it's like a tomato. You wouldn't pull a tomato and bring it in the house for the winter. So you don't do that with the basil either. Uh, biennials, angelica, caraway, parsley. A lot of people think of parsley as a perennial and it's not, it's just that usually you plant it two years in succession. So that kind of starts that timer. So you have parsley for several years. Okay, so there's your growth cycle for your annual from the time of seed, vegetative growth, the flower and the death. And we always think of, of death as a bad thing, but the flower is what is going to produce the, um, the fruit. So for instance, the tomato, you, you want that first tomato. So if you're, if you're adding soil and amending your soil, you wanna be careful that you're not getting too much nitrogen in a fruiting uh, plant because you are definitely wanting to aim it toward that death cycle, which is where you get your fruit. Biennial, same thing. Seed, growth, dormancy, growth, flower, and death. So you just keep going on that. So if you're wanting successive plantings, you wanna be sure to plant, for instance, your parsley. You wanna plant that year one, plant it again year two. If you are able to get it to come up in the garden, then it'll, it'll just ever after keep reseeding for you.
perennial, again, more than two years. Now we are in a harsh environment. So some of the things, if you're at your garden center and you see perennial, be sure and check your zone. Make, make sure you know where you live, where you're planting and what your, your winter conditions are. Uh, even the best perennials can be taken out by a harsh winter. So you wanna be sure that you're, you're understanding what that is. Um, I think, are we zone seven here or six? Anybody? We're zone seven. Seven. Okay, so seven's a tricky zone because a lot of the things <laughs> that throw, you know, even just south of us, like uh, I, I kind of look at that line of demarcation as anything south of Flagstaff or anything south of Oklahoma, they have a, a longer growing season than we do. So you want to make sure that you understand your winter. Let me just add really quick, when we're talking about zones, it's, it's really tricky out here because we have a lot of microclimates with the high, you know, if you live on top, like, um, like um, Ms. Navamsa, she lives up at Shomopavi, her zone is, is a lot different than mine when I live in the valley. And then someone might live closer to the wash where it's a little warm. So there's a lot of microclimate. So we can say we're zone seven, but you have to pay attention to your area. Exactly. Pre prepare for all of those different zones. And, and we'll talk about the little microclimates later on too, because you can kind of establish some, uh, some areas that are a little more protective for your plants. Okay, we're just going to kind of jump into some herbs and uh, show you some pictures and uh, uh, make a list of your questions if you, if you don't get it. Uh, one of my favorites is anise hyssop. Uh, it makes a great tea. It has kind of a, that anise flavor to it. It does come back every year um, and it's great for the butterflies and bees. The more you can attract to your garden, the better pollination you're going to have. And it's beautiful. Uh, all heal. This is a, a plant kind of like, uh, you know, aloe vera doesn't really grow on the prairie for us. Uh, so they use that uh, Kind of like they would aloe vera they made a poultice on it and used it for burns and things again it's just a great low grower and has that great flower for the the uh, pollen basil one of our favorites at home i don't know if you grow a lot of basil out here but basil is such an all over great herb uh, it improves the growth and your flavor of your tomatoes. So if you're planting tomatoes, you want to plant a little basil around them. It'll protect the tomatoes and it'll improve the flavor of that. Uh, don't plant it near rue. Uh, it, will, it will kill the basil or, or otherwise flavor the basil. And the other thing about growing basil is you want to aggressively pinch it back. That's going to improve the, the branches, the bushiness of the plant. Um, you do not want to plant your basil until your average day temperature is over 50. Uh, people always say, oh, we're past the frost date. Frost date doesn't always matter. You want the, the plants to have good warm. Most of, most of your herbs really like warm. So you want to be sure that uh, that ground temperature <laughs> is up and you want to be sure that your air temperature, uh, anything under 50 will kill basil. So I, I don't plant basil at home until well, well into May. Um, and it's not too hot. The hotter it gets in the summer, the, the more your basil will grow if you can keep it watered. And when I talk about pinching it back, there's gonna be these little nodes. Uh, if you're buying basil in a store, maybe you, there's a paper cup that they've planted it in. And it's just tall and stringy. What you want is it's short and, and short. So you look at that stem and you find, see where the purple arrow is, you find that branch that's the center branch and then you see the two branches on either side of that. You're just gonna pinch it through with your fingers, uh, just your fingernail and pinch that off. And then each one of those sets of leaves on either side of that stem are going to become another branch. So every time you do that, when you harvest, harvest your basil, clip it through the stem instead of just taking off one or two leaves and you're improving your plant uh, you're going to get two times as much basil first, then you're going to get four times as much basil, then you get six times as much basil, and you may have basil coming across the yard for you. Uh, basil, again, it's one of those that ac actually needs a little bit more water. So maybe adding containers to your garden is a good option for you. You can even sink them down in the ground just so that they retain a little bit more uh, water for you on mint and basil uh, chives. Those those will take a little bit more water. So you may want to 
kind of do your microclimates even with just uh, uh, containers or a good place that they're getting a lot of water. You can put, um, when I talk containers, you know, it gets quite hot out here, the wind is bad. I don't like anything less than a 12 inch wide, you know, so just make a, make a circle with your arms and that's how big a, a container you wanna start with because it'll grow and it'll take it up. You're gonna be watering a lot if you don't have a, a big enough container. But with that, you can plant about three varieties in it. You can plant basil and a tomato, uh, maybe together or uh, basil and mint, uh, something that you aren't gonna have to worry quite so much about uh, the water quality. This is what I was talking about, maybe having a windbreak for those early plants. You know, once they, once they get growing, then you're gonna have a, a, lot, uh, a lot better time of it. But uh, just that early, early windiness of spring can kind of stress the plants out if they're trying to stay up. Bee balm, this is a, a, a good natural native plant. Uh, it's a great one, again, to a, uh, get the butterflies and bees. Uh, you can make a tea out of it. It's uh, at home, we call it a Swigo tea, but it's a, a, a good tea maker. And once you get it established, it should come back for you every year. It's a, it's a good hardy perennial. Borage, um, I don't know if lamb's ear grows out here uh, very much, but borage is a nice alternative to lamb's ear because it tastes a little better. Uh, and as gardeners, we're always looking for that blue flower. Blue flowers are just very uncommon. And so uh, borage does grow blue flower. The leaves are big and soft and velvety and it attracts not only bees, but it's a great nectar flower because it refills with nectar about every two minutes. So you wanna be sure to get something out there to feed those bees. Uh, catnip also will drive your cats crazy. Uh, usually when it's dry, the fresh, uh, fresh catnip doesn't seem to bother them as much but it makes a nice little border plant. If you're, if you're looking for something to take up some room so that it's not a weed, uh, you can plant some catnip or cat mint out there. Chamomile, as, as in chamomile tea, um, I, I watch a lot of cooking shows because we like to eat, I know you can't tell, but uh, when, you, when you do chamomile, it's the flowers that they make the tea out of, but you can also uh, cook with the leaves. Uh, they're doing that on Iron Chef and uh, some of those cooking shows a lot more. And I thought, oh, I never tried that. So it, it gives a nice kind of little bright, fresh, fresh flower for that. There are two different varieties of chamomile. Uh, there's the annual kind, which comes back and that's more common for tea because it grows a lot more uh, flowers. But there's also Roman chamomile, which is a perennial. So you can use that. It's a little more low growing, but it doesn't flower as much. Chives, I really like chives because they're one of the first things that come up for us in the spring and they have such happy little uh, purple flowers. You can cook the flowers as well as the, as the uh, leaves, the chive leaves. Um, we grow asparagus at home, so I like to pull off those flowers and top, pop them in so you get that little hint of, of onion flavor and they are a perennial, so it makes it really nice uh, when you come out and when you're harvesting, you just take your scissors out and just grab a handful lop it off with scissors and then I don't even use a knife. I just cut it back down with the scissors and make my little chives. Cilantro, I, we're all big fans of cilantro. Cilantro can be a little hard because it doesn't like to grow until it's 70 degrees, but it bolts if it gets up to 90. So if you think about that, sometimes in our growing conditions, that can be like a two week period. Uh, so cilantro is another one that you could just grow a lot of early on and then kind of move it into the shade and, and you might get another couple of weeks uh, out of it. What will happen is it kind of looks like parsley, doesn't it? So you can just cut it off like you do parsley just with your scissors, leave some growth under there and it'll keep growing. Once it hits that, uh, that going to seed phase or uh, uh, it's, it's when your, your cilantro is kind of going to fade out, it's going to shoot up a very tough. Uh, stem to it and then that'll kind of bloom out into a flower and you'll see all the seeds and your cilantro at that point is done it's it's had its uh had its little uh walk of fame but you can use all those seeds you can either replant them for more cilantro or you can take the seeds and that's coriander and you can just bruise that and you can use it for a, a marinade you can use it in uh, in any kind of cooking cut it back often dill is another one at it is a real benefit for corn, lettuce, cucumbers, and carrots to grow. 
Uh, it's another great feeder plant for your, for your butterfly population. You can use both the seed and the fresh fern. Now there's a couple of different varieties of dill out there. And if they have a name like bouquet or all green, they will not make the umbral, the seed umbral, which we use a lot when we're making pickles. Um, but fresh dill is, is also beautiful in flower arrangements or just uh, to use like on fish or salmon or chicken or in, in great cooking. So you can, you can get either kind. You just want to be sure that you know which variety that you've got, because if you've gotten one that says bouquet, you're not going to get that big umbral. Um, in an ironic twist, yes, dill yes. almost always grows after or grows out before <laughs> cucumbers come. So if you're, if you're wanting some to pickle with, then you're going to have to hang it and dry it and wait until uh, your cucumbers are ready for those pickles. Feverfew, and here's another thing you want to be sure that you're watching what you're doing. Feverfew is a, a beautiful herb. Uh, it looks a lot like, um, the flower looks very much like chamomile, um, but it is in the uh, mum family. So it contains pyrethrins. So it is a bee repellent. So you want to be sure that you're not planting something that's a repellent in the middle of your bee garden or wherever you're, you're uh, trying to attract bees to. You want to be sure that you're you're kind of sectioning off your garden. Uh, a lot of people use it for migra migraines and uh, you can make the tea. It often will come back. Uh, it's, it's more of a tender perennial, so it may not always come back for you, but if, it's, if it finds a happy home, then it, you can get several years out of it. This is just kind of gives you a placement uh, area for how you want your, your garden. This, is, this one is mostly um, dry loving plants. So you can see they're just planted in and amongst the, the things. I always think of Italy when I think of herbs because they grow a lot of, it, of, of herbs in Italy. If you think of the landscape of Italy, very dry, very poor soil, lots of rocks, you know, and all of those shoals. So, uh, so we're in a good place. Hyssop, another uh, one, it just, it helps uh, your cabbage moths. It keeps uh, all those things that are taking your good cabbages and stuff. Uh, in the spring, uh, cauliflower, some of those, they're very susceptible to moth damage. So if you plant a little bit of hyssop in between, uh, it will not improve your radishes. So you want to be sure that you're, you're watching your uh, companion planting. Also another great uh, purple flower, also another great attractor for your bees and your uh, butterflies. Fennel, the fennel's a kind of a peculiar one. This is bulbing fennel, which is also known as Florence fennel. If you plant it in the spring, you will get the fan shape that you see here. If you plant it in the fall, you will get more of the bulb, the traditional bulb. The great thing about planting it in the spring and getting this fan shape is that you can peel off the sides uh, so that you don't have to pull the whole bulb to use it. So you can just shave that bottom and get that same flavor that you'd get from the bulb. Um, the fern is great. Uh, again, it's a very, um, a very strong anise flavor, but it's a little fresher than some of the anise flavor, but plant it back and behind something because it will, it will spoil uh, the flavor of most of your other herbs. Lavender. Uh, Lavender is a bit challenging for some people. I'm not honestly sure how well it does out here. Uh, I would think pretty well because you've got the super well-drained soil and you've got the dry element, which is what usually takes lavender out. If you see the base of your lavender plant getting kind of black, it's because it's getting splashed back or it's getting uh, too much water. So you can even put a little pea gravel or uh, just regular rock around the base of it so you don't get that splash back from when it does rain. Um, you want to keep it Keep it very dry. Uh, that doesn't mean crisp. So you want to be sure that it's, it's not looking faint. Uh, in the spring, when you see your plants, if, if the lavender and the uh, rosemary, if those plants are kind of gray or gray green, you're probably okay. If they're brown, they're going down. Then you're going to trim your lavender in a dome shape because you don't want a lot of ice building up. You don't want a lot of snow building up on it. So they tend to grow like this. And what you want to do is each spring and fall for the first two or three years is you want to trim off to make it a dome shape. You want the center of your lavender and, and your rosemary as well to be tall 
and the sides to be shorter. That way, if the ice and snow build up, it doesn't pull apart those uh, stems, the structure of it. It can pull that apart and you won't even see it and it'll destroy that tap root. And then it's just all done. After you've done it two or three years, then chances are you're gonna automatically do it when you harvest your, your beautiful lavender in the spring. It's already kind of in that shape. So you, once you've got about three to five years, you can get away with just one trimming a year. Lemon balm is one of my favorites because it grows very well, almost like a weed. It's, um, people think it's a mint, uh, the, the greater mint plant uh, category is very large. So anything with a square stem has come from the mint family. Um, you can plant it with cucumbers and tomatoes. And I haven't probably bought a lemon in, I don't know, maybe 30 years now since we've been doing herbs. Uh, I just chop this up and use it in almost any of my lemon recipes. I use it with fish, chicken, and salads. Uh, this and just plain mint makes a wonderful sun tea. I just put my jar out, uh, put a big handful of both the mint and the, um, the uh, lemon balm in together. Most of your herbs, if they're edible, uh, you can make tea out of them. So we uh, have a lady in our herb club and she makes what we uh, lovingly refer to as pantyhose tea. She will <laughs> use the hose to put her herbs in and then uh, put it as, use it as a strainer. And we like to think that she probably washed them first. Uh, this is another example of a shade structure. Uh, just, just about anything, once it gets uh, uh, mid-July, you're gonna have a lot of heat, a lot of sun blister. So if you can get something uh, reflective shading, um, old quilts, gutty sacks, uh, anything just to kind of protect the, those tomatoes or those uh, things that'll blister a little bit. All of the annuals usually just need a little bit of help through that uh, really hot part of the summer. Lemon verbena, probably the purest of the, of the herbs. It, I like it because it repels lots of things in the garden. If you try to bring it in in the winter, it is a white fly magnet. So chances are you're going to bring in white flies to your house. So uh, it's one that's a more tender perennial. Uh, if you're wanting to grow it, um, Probably it's best to think of it as an annual and just put a put a new plant out each time. But it again has a very pure lemon flavor and lemon scent. A little woodier than the uh, lemon balm. Lemon grass. We're good to do all the lemons. Uh, anything lemon scented. You know, the the garden stores are always saying plant this to repel mosquitoes. Plant this to repel mosquitoes. It's actually any. It's the the scent and the flavor of lemons that repel the mosquitoes. So anything, uh, lemon balm will work, lemon grass will work to, to kind of repel mosquitoes. The thing about it is you've got to kind of have it, have a lot of it and, and where you're gonna be out. So if you've got a little patio area or right by your front door or someplace like that, you can, uh, you can put the, the lemon grass or the lemon balm, lemon verbena, uh, lemon basil, any, anything like that will help uh, help repel them. It doesn't kill them. It just, it says, stay away. I'm working here. Uh, again, lemongrass is usually not winter hardy. There are two varieties. Uh, one is, is the grassy grass and it just kind of grows like pampas grass. And then the other is the bulbing kind. Uh, both are perfectly great to cook with. Uh, you can, when you save them, you can kind of wind them around your fingers like this and then just make a little packet. I did that in Vietnam. And then you can just toss that in when you're uh, stir frying, you can toss it in your tea. Uh, it's, it's great to save it. Sometimes you can winter that over if you've got like a protected place, uh, an old garage or a shed, um, cut it back down. Sometimes it'll come back, but it's, it's a little less winter hardy than, than many of the herbs. Lovage. Lovage can get quite tall if you haven't ever planted it before. It's uh, kind of in the celery family and it gives you that good uh, celery flavor. It will grow about five feet tall if it's in a, it's in a happy place. Um, again, we have clay, so ours usually stays more like three foot, uh, but you can boil it down and make vegetable stock out of it. Uh, you can add some other herbs with it and it makes just a really good soup base. Uh, for just about anything that you're making. Haven't tried it in the Nequiti. Uh, mint, mint has the need for a little bit more water, but again, it is it can be invasive garden. So I always recommend planting mint in some sort of container. 
uh, even just like a big old five gallon bucket from one of the uh, box stores, you could knock the bottom or at least part of the bottom out, sink it clear down in the ground uh, and leave it up about two inches. Um, that'll protect it from taking over uh, the other parts of your garden. But uh, mint is very giving. It uh, will usually come back year after year after year, even if you don't want it to. Uh, the great thing about it is for those of us that have heavy clay soil, it will get in there and break up that soil. So the roots are very good. So if you plant mint or lemon balm, either one, you're going to get some good uh, breaking up of that soil and uh, some just good reaction. So you hoe that in and it's just almost like a living compost. Nasturtiums, they are beautiful flowers. The flowers are also edible. It repels a host of, uh, of bugs and uh, predators. So you can put that, that out there. It does not like the hottest heat of the summer. So this is more like a, a end of April through June. Uh, once you get to 4th of July, the flowers are gonna kind of flag off. So that shade system that we talked about, or if you've planted them in a, in a container, you can move that container more into the shade and then they'll bloom again in the fall. Uh, they are true um, annual, so they're not going to come back for you next year, but they grow a, a seed that looks kind of like a caper. So you can harvest those seeds and have your seed to plant them again next year. Uh, all, of the, all of the flower is edible, both the leaves and the, the flowers. They make beautiful little salads. Uh, I think the, the leaves are a little pepperier, uh, so I prefer the flowers, but there are a lot of people that use both the leaves and the flowers. This particular variety, you can see the variegation on the leaves is called Alaska. And you can get several different varieties of nasturtiums. Oregano, uh, Susan talked about the uh, uh, upcoming poultry seminar. Oregano is a great uh, thing to have for your chickens. It's a good graze for them. It's kind of a natural antibiotic. Uh, so it helps both the, both the chickens and the people. So if you can use a little oregano, Oregano will grow and it should come back year after year if it's just the, the regular Greek or Italian oregano. Uh, the Greek oregano has a rounder leaf. The Italian oregano has more of a little pointy leaf. Um, both of them taste pretty much the same. I have chefs that go both ways, so you can use either. Uh, if you get a good stand of oregano established, about every five years, you want to go out there and take a spade and just drive it through the center of it and divide it because it will kind of uh, sap your soil of flavor. So about every five years that you want to improve the flavor of your oregano, you want to move it to a new location. And you can, it's another one that you can just kind of till in or hoe in uh, and let it uh, replenish the soil on its own. I do put mine a lot by my sweet peppers. We, we don't do beans very well, but the sweet peppers work. So sure, try it with your beans another little example of how if you've got more of a terraced area if your if your ground isn't uh, traditionally flat and a little hard to get around you can you can kind of make your own little planting boxes you can make an area where you can just walk through and it's a little easier to care for if you've got just some established area that uh, this is the garden this is the path a uh, little easier to keep up on and this one has a nice trellis. There's a lot of things, you know, your beans, your, uh, your climbing uh, flowers. Uh, it's nice to have a good trellis so something can go up and a shady spot to sit when you get tired. Uh, parsley, it likes chives, tomatoes, carrots, roses, and asparagus. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the biennial aspect of parsley. Flat leaf parsley, curly parsley, both of them will attract your caterpillars. So if you're really wanting to get your butterfly garden going, plant uh, one for you and five for the, the uh, caterpillars because they will, they will eat it. It's just a great host plant for those caterpillars. And they don't care if it's curly or flat. Rosemary, you want to plant it near your cabbage, beans, your carrots, your sage. Again, it's a, a dry loving herb, but it doesn't necessarily like the cold, the only variety that I think would do well here year after year is probably ARP. Uh, it's a little hardier than, than some of the others. Uh, we talked about trimming in the dome shape. Rosemary, you want to trim more like a Christmas tree so that the, again, the top once is where you want uh, your highest point so that it doesn't 
go down. Rosemary is another one that you can in fact plant in a pot and then maybe find a little shelter for it in the winter and get that, you know, down in Phoenix and San Diego, they get nine foot hedges of rosemary. That's not the case uh, once you get up into the zone uh, seven. But uh, the other thing to remember about rosemary, and this is probably what kills the most of it, I, out here on the res, I don't think we have any uh, chlorine in our water, I'm not sure, uh, but it is very susceptible to chlorine. So if you have chlorinated water, you want to put it in the pitcher, leave it out overnight for 24 hours so that the chlorine will dissipate. Uh, also rainwater will water them just fine. Rue, this is another uh, attractor plant. Uh, it's where the caterpillars will lay their eggs for your um, butterflies. It is one of those plants that you want to be careful to because it has the photosynthesis, photosensitive uh, oils in it. So if you're out and you're touching it in the, in the summer of the heat, you may get a rash on your hands. So either use gloves or plant it someplace that you're not going to be in and around. You don't want to plant it in with your vegetables that you'll be picking. Uh, but it is a great host plant. It's what they used to pound up in the mid medieval times to hide the flavor of rotting meat. Uh, so I'm not sure that uh, you wanna eat it, but it is a, it's, it's a great companion plant. Sage, there's lots of different varieties of sage. I, I love the beautiful colors when I come out here to see, uh, to see all the sage. It improves your tomatoes, carrots, cabbage, uh, goes well with rosemary because it's another dry love. It's one of the first plants to bloom in the spring right after the chives. You can bundle it, it's very easy to dry. Uh, it, it grows another big beautiful love, kind of a velvety flower. A, if a, an herb is edible, chances are the flower is edible. So you can get a lot of good flavor out of those early, uh, early blooms. This variety that you see with the long leaves is called extracta. And it's about 75% higher in essential oils than just some of the regular sages. Santalina, it's a really aromatic uh, plant and it repels a lot of just your, your little crawly thing. You know, when you walk through the garden, you don't even know what that bug is. You know, the mites or the little flea flies or things like that. Santalina will kind of uh, repel some of that. It grows a little tiny yellow button-like flower this is not an edible, but uh, what they used to do is bundle it up and hang it to repel the mice, like in the old pantries and stuff. So, you know, maybe put it in with the flour or something so that uh, it does repel some of those. Uh, savory, uh, there are two different varieties. One is the more traditional, the lower right hand sign uh, is summer savory. It grows very quickly, uh, gets very tall and gangly. It's another one that uh, if you if you want to keep picking it, you have to uh, keep trimming it back. Um, it's kind of a peppery uh, one. They use it in their green bean and ham soup. Uh, I use it in just about everything. I love it in scrambled eggs because it's got that nice peppery flavor. The one that's above it is called uh, winter savory and it is a perennial and it'll come back year after year. Has almost the exact same flavor but a very different consistency. Um, the leaves are a little waxier, uh, the stalk is a little heavier. So it's, it's just uh, some years uh, when you're saving seed, savory is one of those seeds like chives. It's only gonna last one year. You wanna be sure you have fresh seed uh, on those because they just, they use their, they lose their germination rate. So I started planting the winter savory just so I'd have something to offer in case we had a, a seed fail, which uh, often we do with the summer savory. That's kind of a nice little pink flower. Uh, thyme is another great uh, dry, dry loving plant. And there's lots and lots of different varieties of it. Uh, English thyme, uh, creeping thyme, some of them grow upright, some of them bush out. Uh, again, you want very dry uh, conditions for this. And when we say dry, we mean, you know, still water it so that it'll grow. Uh, if it's crisp, it's probably already gone. So you wanna be sure that you're uh, keeping up on it. But all of the herbs, like I said, they can benefit from just taking those scissors out and turn them and trimming them and making them a little bit bushy. Um, any variety that has a fruit name in front of it is probably not gonna be perennial. For instance, lemon thyme rarely comes back, uh, orange thyme rarely comes back, anything like that 
but they grow so fast and they're worth it to just uh, trim those up and, and dry them or freeze them for your, uh, for your use in the winter. Vanilla grass, it's, it grows very much like the, the lemongrass planted it. It's also called sweet grass and it has the flavor of vanilla once it's dried. Uh, it's really got a nice scent in the garden. Um, once again, once it's dried and you can use it uh, to weave with. Uh, yarrow, that's another good, uh, it's, it's one of the few native Kansas plants that we have, and I believe it grows pretty well out here. It's a, a nice hardy perennial, uh, and it, it helps everything. It doesn't have any real scent to itself, but it'll help the flavor of, uh, of all your other plants. Thing to remember about your gardens is you want to walk it as much as possible. Most of the things that happen like insect damage or, or uh, I don't know, maybe you've got dogs running through, uh, you can kind of keep up on some of that if you walk your garden really often. You can catch something before it becomes. You want to pinch back those herbs often. What I like to do is when I'm just, get, just getting started and you're pinching those back and you just got a few things, I just take an ice cube tray out with me and I poke those in the ice cube tray and then I fill it with either broth or juice or something that I'm going to cook with, put it in and then pop them out and just put them in a, in a Ziploc bag. Um, they are super easy to dry. So you can just hang them. If you're going to hang them, uh, rubber bands work really well because you lose, you lose your stock space as they dry. Uh, so if you've done it with a string, you're going to be retying that string. You can just spread it out on cookie sheets and, and they'll dry. Uh, put them in with your veggies, your eggs. Um, if you don't know what you want to use an herb for, uh, plain chicken breast or scrambled eggs is a good way to get that taste. Uh, so you think, oh man, I'd like to try that with pork or that sounds like it'd be really good with beans, something like that. Um, there's no herb police, so they're not going to tell you uh, if you find a recipe that you don't like that herb, but you want to try the recipe, substitute another recipe. Um, I think on the handouts, you'll see our website, which is nefffamilyfarm.com. And I have about 30 pages of recipes on there for you. And you're welcome to, to use those as you will, Susan. And the only recommendation I would give to you guys all is she gave us like 30, 30 herbs. I would maybe choose two, one or two for this year and, and, or three and try them and say, okay, remember my, my last class, I talk about dating. We want to date these plants so we can get to know them really well. If you start, if you plant 10 of them, you're going to lose track. And that's just kind of, you, or you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to police you either, but those are just some ideas. So when I took this class, I, I labeled maybe two that I want to try this year that I haven't. So that's just kind of my approach. Well, ARP, it's going to be about the, the best rosemary you can get in this area. Uh, we just have such a short season with our, with our harsh winter. Uh, so failing that, I would plant it like in, in maybe a big, like a whiskey barrel or something that you could maybe move if you find out that it's not going to go. Uh, people try to take too good a care of it. If, if you have an herb and some people want to go up and dig it out and bring it into the house, you're not going to want to do that because that's, that's inviting you to overwater it when you bring it in because it wants to go dormant. So you want to keep that dormancy going. Um, but ARP is about it. I, I, let me just add a little bit to rosemary. Um, I've tried three or four years to plant rosemary and it always died over winter. Uh, cause it's, it's pretty cold. I don't know what variety I got, but that finally took. And I think the location is key if you're going to leave it outside. So I Definitely. planted mine on the South face of my house and it's in this corner right here. It's right in the corner. So it gets a lot of sun in the summertime. It's very hot. I never water it. It just gets rainwater. Um, I, I mulch the heck out of it in winter months with straw to help it um, over the winter. And, and that's what finally helped it um, survive. So it just, I think location, cause it likes really, really hot sun and it, and it can't freeze too much in the winter. So I think that's a big part of the success of rosemary. If you're gonna choose to grow one or two or three of the herbs that she mentioned this year, I think three things, one of the things you need to find out is, is it an annual or perennial? Those are the, the big question you're going to ask yourself. So if I plant this this year, if it's an annual, I'm going to have to plant it every year or I'm going to plant it again next year. 
but I encourage you to go do your own research on different, um, on these plants and look them up and get to know them more. Um, trying to think what else. Oh, the dry watering. Is this a, this is a plant that requires a lot of water or a little bit of water? You know, I mean, that's relative. So we have to figure out what that means, but, um, those are the, probably the two big questions you would ask yourself if you're going to ask them, is it an annual perennial? And then is it a wa high water plant or a low water plant? I did forget the rule of three on perennials. You know, people plant a perennial and they expect it to just take off. And what the rule is, is first year they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap. So don't get discouraged if you put out your, your rosemary. It's going to take a couple of years if it lives for it to, to gain any you know, look at it and think, what's going on here? It's just, it's just sitting. And that's what they do is they just sit for a couple of years. It, chlorine can be a problem. Uh, so again, you can leave your chlorine for, for small waterings, you can leave it out. Otherwise you're going to have to start trying to collect rainwater or something because it, it can be bad for, uh, for a lot of different plants, but particularly rosemary and lavender. Um, they, they kind of absorb it and collect it and it just, it just kills the plant uh, right away. So as, as much as possible, if you can use uh, rainwater, collect uh, snow, or just start leaving large amounts of water out to, to dissipate the chlorine. It takes about 24 hours for a gallon to dissipate the, the chlorine. Check out is, our website for, for recipes. And uh, her website is at um, Neff Family Farms, I believe. One farm. Farm, yeah. Neff Family Farm. Yeah, she can't manage more than two things, couple things. That rate, it's big. We thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Kay, for joining us today. She's here as a resource. She's a part of our gardening community here now. Um, thank you all, everybody, for coming. I hope you had a great time and learned uh, something new. And we will um, uh, just want to wish you a good Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your day.